There certainly is, uh, uh, I, I think chapter 10 kind of begins to, to do a couple of things. One is that uh, we just last week went through uh, the last of the trumpet judgments. Remember there were six seal judgments, that's what kicked everything off. There was the concern in heaven, you know, who is worthy to take the scroll and open its seals. Uh, and, uh, and of course, it's Jesus that uh, comes forward that begins to do that. And, and it literally, on a scroll, he's removing that wax seal so the scroll can unroll. And, uh, and what's read there is what's taking place uh, in what's called the Great Tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, uh, a couple of different names in the Old Testament. John would be familiar, again, with what Daniel said. John knows it's going to be a seven-year period. Uh, Jesus has uh, talked about it, that in the middle of that seven-year period, it's divided up, and, and this uh, world leader that we refer to as the Antichrist will, at that point, uh, walk into a newly rebuilt Jewish temple and, uh, and commit what Daniel said, what Jesus reiterated, the abomination that causes desolation. He will set up an image of himself, proclaim himself to be God, and demand to be worshipped at that point. In that first three and a half year period, he's the friend of Israel. He's uh, allowed them to get that temple rebuilt. And uh, even though there are these horrific supernatural events that are judgments of God taking place uh, on planet Earth, uh, you've got uh, 144,000 uh, Jewish believers that have come to faith in Christ, that have a seal placed on them, that protect them from the Antichrist and protect them from these uh, quote, supernatural disasters that are happening. They're out sharing the gospel so that every man and woman and child, regardless of their language or culture or background, are going to be able to hear the gospel, have an opportunity to respond to it, and there will be a worldwide revival that's going on. Of course, when uh, that happens, the Antichrist will persecute them, and there'll be uh, untold you know, uh, tens of thousands that are, that are martyred for their faith. So all of this is going on in the first three and a half years. And now it's going to get worse, uh, is, is the idea. Uh, that the Antichrist will switch from being a friend of Israel to the persecutor of Israel. And that's what Jesus spoke about in Matthew 24. He says, when you see these things happening, and then he describes that and quotes Daniel, he said, then flee. Pray that it's not in winter. Pray that you're not pregnant. Pray that it's not on the Shabbat or on the Sabbath that you'll be able to flee. And we're going to look at a couple of verses that pertain to that uh, as well this morning. But again, uh, you know, can you imagine John? John is hearing all this. John is writing all this down. Uh, John has got the big picture from Daniel and the other prophets, but now he's getting uh, details. How bad is, uh, is bad going to be? And, uh, and even, that's been part of um, uh, at least my struggle in, in teaching through the book of Revelation because of the fact that um, it's, it's just, it's difficult to go through some of these chapters like last week of reading about the two demonic armies that will cover the face of the earth and kill so many and uh, torture uh, everyone and so forth. It's, uh, it's tough to go through these things. And yet, again, in chapter 10, now that we've reached the midpoint of the tribulation, we have a little more what we call parenthetical or a parenthesis on terms of let's kind of stop the, the chronology of the time clock and go, what's happening now at this point? And, uh, and one of the things that's going to happen that we'll see here is this mighty angel comes down from heaven, begins to instruct John, and I think gives an explanation as to why we love prophecy I mean, when we have a prophecy conference, this place is packed out because we love to know that the Bible is reliable. We love the fact that God predicted events in advance, and then historically they happened exactly the way the Bible said that they would happen. It's one of the great proofs that we have to, uh, to friends and to family members and those that we're sharing with that we can trust and rely upon Scripture, predictive prophecy. We, we love it. We would say it's sweet to our mouth like honey, but when we start looking at some of the details of what happens in the future, as we'll see in this text, it's kind of bitter uh, at the same time because what's, what's happening. And I think the point of what uh, uh, the exhortation to John and to us, to him, is to continue. We need to continue. And when we continue, certainly it needs to be with some uh, degree of, of compassion. There's a 
a, a sitcom that was very popular at uh, one point in time on, on television, and, and uh, there was a conversation uh, once in a while on this show, uh, the idea of religion would come up, and, and it was funny because one of the main stars in the show who is, who is uh, Jewish and not a believer is going out with a, uh, a person, a, a guy that uh, proclaims to be a Christian and so forth, and, uh, and uh, the character, Elaine says, uh, uh, do you believe in God? And the boyfriend says, uh, yes, I, I believe in God. And, and she says then, is it a problem for me that I'm not religious? Uh, and he says, no, it's not a problem for me. Well, how's that? And he says, well, I'm not the one going to hell. Well, <laughs> well that, that all may be true, but uh, th th that is the, the opposite extreme, of I think, of chapter 10 here, this idea of, of yes, these things are going to happen. Yes, they're going to be true, but there's still got to be some compassion in our heart uh, over, over these things. There was, I um, heard a story about three, three guys that were out uh, playing golf. One was a doctor, one was an engineer, and one was a, uh, a pastor. And they were, uh, they were playing, they played together every week, and they were kind of uh, uh, complaining that the group in front of them was taking so long. And if you play golf, that's one of the issues. You, you think you're going to be able to get through this thing, no problem, and not have to wait. But sometimes on a busy day, you wait, you wait, you wait. kind of drives you crazy. And these guys were being held up for quite a long time. And finally, one of the groundskeepers came by, and uh, they said, what is the deal with these guys? It takes them forever. And the groundkeeper, he looked, he says, oh, he said, well, those guys are firefighters, and, uh, and two of those guys up there are blind. They, our, our country club here caught on fire a couple of years ago, and two of these guys were injured and were blinded. We let them play free any anytime they want. And they're like, oh, and they kind of felt bad and everything. And the doctor said, well, I, I know a guy that's a specialist. Maybe I'll, I'll try to talk to them and talk to him. Maybe there's something, you know, that can be done medically to, to help them. And the, uh, the pastor said, um, oh, I feel bad. I had no idea. I'll certainly keep them uh, in, in my prayers. And, and the engineer said, you know, that's all fine, but as long as that's the case, why can't you have them play at night? <laughs> Again, not, not the most compassion there, but uh, we don't want to fall in either of those categories. Uh, but it is a, a, a difficult issue that we struggle with, this idea of the judgment of God. N.T. Wright says that the word judgment carries negative overtones for a good many people in our liberal and post-liberal world. We need to remind ourselves that throughout the Bible, God's coming judgment is a good thing, something to be celebrated, longed for, yearned over. It causes people to shout for joy in the trees of the field, to clap their hands in a world of systematic injustice, bullying, violence, arrogance, and oppression. The thought that there might come a day when the wicked are firmly put in their place and the poor and the weak are given their due is the best news there can be. Faced in a world in rebellion, a world full of uh, ex exploitation and wickedness, a good God must be a God of judgment. I was just reading uh, uh, another article uh, again last night of the worldwide slave trade that uh, we have in the world today, uh, and it's uh, horrific. Uh, it's, um, it's just tens and tens and tens of thousands. It, there, it's never been this bad ever in, in the history of the world. It's just uh, horrific, uh, some of the things that are going on in the world today. Those things will all be dealt with in the future. God will deal with them. He'll right all the wrongs and the injustices. But still, this idea of judgment, as we read about it in the book of Revelation, can be, as we would say, a bitter pill to swallow sometimes. Let's take a look at this mighty angel. He's described for us in the first four verses. Again, we're in chapter 10. I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was on his head. His face was like the sun and his feet like the pillars of fire. He had a little book open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea, and his left foot on the land. And he cried with a loud voice as when a lion roars. When he cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered and do not write them. So two aspects to the description of this mighty angel that are, are important uh, to look at because he can, we can misidentify who he is. Um, he's identified certainly or described as being powerful 
And uh, we are reminded the fact that in the book of Revelation, angels are always angels. They're never a metaphor for something else. This, this is uh, uh, an angel, and he's a, a mighty angel. Notice his uh, uh, description, four things about him. He's, he's clothed with a cloud. And, uh, and certainly, uh, this could be significant because of the fact that, that uh, a cloud, at least in the Old Testament, was always representative of the, uh, the presence of God. You know, it's a cloud that led the children of Israel through the wilderness by day, a pillar of fire by night. As uh, Moses dedicates the tabernacle, a cloud filled it. As Solomon dedicates the temple, a cloud filled it that we refer to as the Shekinah glory of God. Well, here's a mighty angel that now is clothed with a cloud. And what I, I want to say is that uh, most of the books in, in my library say that this angel is Jesus Christ and that these, these attributes, the identifying marks of him, speak of divine presence. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to refute that in a moment, but I just want you to know that's, that you, as we go through this, I'll point out why uh, most people kind of identify this angel as, as being Jesus Christ. And one is because when he comes, I mean, this is a, a mighty angel. Uh, he's pretty big, <laughs> you know, one foot on the land, one on the, uh, one on the, uh, the sea. And, uh, and he is clothed with a cloud, which would make some writers to, again, look back to the Old Testament and see, hey, that's a, uh, at least a symbol of God's presence. Uh, the second thing, there's a rainbow on his head. And uh, the, uh, again, the rainbow that we saw back in chapter 4 was around the throne of God. And, and we talked about Psalm 89. Psalm 89 is about the, uh, the faithfulness of God. God always keeps his promises. Uh, and in that psalm, it talks about how there, and plus there is the sign that is in the sky that reminds us of God's faithfulness. And that sign is, is a rainbow. You and I, one day uh, in heaven, as we looked at in chapter 4, as we gaze upon the throne of God the Father, we'll see that rainbow, and it will remind us of the faithfulness of God. And certainly it will be quite overwhelming to us at, uh, at that point. Uh, so here's this mighty angel. He's uh, wrapped, in a sense, uh, in a cloud. He has a rainbow over his head, which could be then symbolic or, or representative of uh, uh, someone from the very throne of God. Three, his face is like the sun, which uh, reminds us again in chapter one, we get this incredible description to kind of set the stage of Jesus Christ, where it says in verse 16, his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. So a mighty angel, you know, wrapped in a cloud, rainbow over his head, face shining like the sun. Uh, again, these things are at least symbolically sound a lot like some of the description of, uh, uh, of Jesus Christ. And then for his feet like pillars of fire. Uh, and again in chapter 1 verse 15 of that description of Jesus. His feet were like fine brass as if refined in the furnace. So uh, lots, of, lots of similarities here. But, but I think we need to make a, a, an important uh, uh, distinction here. Again, uh, this is an angel. Angels are never metaphors for anything else. If it says it's an angel, it's an angel. That's consistent throughout. Uh, the book of Revelation. The other thing that is consistent, though, is that Jesus Christ is never, ever, ever described in the New Testament as being any kind of an angel. You have references in the Old Testament of the angel of the Lord, and the language is very different there, where we have a possible appearance of Jesus Christ. We call it a theophany or a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament, but we never have it in the New Testament. The other thing that is uh, distinctive in verse 1, it says, uh, it says uh, there was another angel. And John has a choice between a couple of Greek words here. He can choose a word that means there's another angel of the same kind that we've already been discussing. Or he can choose a different word that says, here is another angel that is absolutely different in nature and character and everything else from all the other angels that I previously mentioned. He chooses the word, this is another angel of the same kind. So just based on that word alone, you've got angels blowing trumpets, you've got angels we've seen in heaven and so forth. I think based on that word alone, this can't be Jesus Christ. Uh, but what I do want to say is that obviously by identifying him with certain things, that, or at least the, would it suggest this angel is not, not your average angel. And we've talked about 
you know, we've had pictures of uh, the throne of God, of the seraphim, of the cherubim, of the, uh, the, the, you know, the mighty ones around the throne of God, the ones that orchestrate worship. We've talked about there, are, there is a hierarchy of, of angels uh, in, in heaven that are there, ministering spirits. The writer of Hebrews tells us to do the, the bidding uh, and, uh, of God and are there to serve him and even to, uh, to minister to us. This is a very, very different angel, uh, obviously. Uh, again, so I don't think that it is Jesus Christ, although a lot of writers do. Uh, I don't think so because of the fact that Jesus is never referred to an angel in the New Testament and the fact that uh, this is an angel of the same kind of angel that's been uh, referred to consistently throughout the book. I think it's uh, good to stay clear on that because that's where a lot of the... Uh, some of the cults get off. The Jehovah's Witness, again, believe that Jesus is Michael the archangel. I don't know if you knew that, but that's their contention. Uh, he is not the, the son of God or God the son. He is Michael the archangel. And again, the Mormons believe that he is the, the half-spirit brother of Lucifer. He is a son of God, even as there are many sons of God. And if you're a good Mormon, follow the traditions and so forth, you can become a son of God or a God-man yourself, even as Jesus was. So uh, they get very, very wrong in their theology in terms of who, who Jesus is, even though they might uh, be very sincere even though they uh, might be very caring and very devoted uh, to their cause and so forth, uh, where they really miss the mark is in the identity of Jesus. So I think we need to be very careful. So who is the angel? Well, uh, I, I think there's, uh, there's really only two possibilities because, and we're going to go on and look at some more characteristics of this angel in a moment, but uh, I think he's either got to be Gabriel or Michael. They're the only two that are really ever mentioned by name in the Bible, and they're the two that seem to be more powerful than, uh, than the others. Uh, Gabriel's name itself means the strength of God. Uh, but it's really Michael that plays, seems to play an important role in terms of God's prophetic plan. Uh, when, uh, when Daniel is talking about things that are going to happen in the future, if he's going to mention a mighty angel, it's Michael. Uh, and we're going to read that uh, uh, a couple of passages here further on in Revelation where we see Michael again playing uh, an important role as, as well. His name means uh, who, is, who is like God. Jude tells us that he is the only archangel. We see sometimes uh, you, you'll hear people say that phrase, archangels, but there's really only one uh, in, its, in its Michael. So Again, a little, little theology, a little doctrine. Kind of stay with me here for a, a moment. Uh, in chapter 12, Daniel describes the, the tribulation. And, uh, and we went through, through that in some detail. And we've, we've got that for you on the website or on MP3 if you want to look at it sometime. But uh, he describes it a time of great distress. But in the middle of that time of great distress, in the middle of the tribulation, then, then uh, Daniel says this about Michael. In, in chapter 12, verse 1, he says, At that time, Michael will, shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, Israel. During the tribulation, talked about it uh, a little bit uh, before, again, when the Antichrist begins to persecute in the middle of the persecution, when he begins to persecute uh, the, uh, the Jewish people, Israel, Jesus tells them, warns them. When that happens, flee, get out of the city, flee into the wilderness. And we know from other passages where they will flee will be a place in Hebrew called Basra or in, uh, uh, or in uh, English is uh, Petra, which is a, an actual place uh, in present day Jordan. And here it's uh, Daniel that tells us that Michael, the archangel, will stand up and he will protect uh, that, that group of people fleeing to present day Jordan. That's why when uh, you know, people go to tours of the Middle East or to Israel. A lot of Christians like to go to Jordan and see Petra, not because they, f they filmed Raiders of the Lost Ark. No, what was the second one? It was uh, the third one. There's one of the Indiana Jones films, uh, Last Crusade. Last Crusade. Uh, but if you want to get that video, that's filmed in Petra. That's the city. That's that's where uh, the Jews will flee to through uh, to at that time. There's even been. I read a story a number of years ago, some Christian businessmen that took a bunch of uh, uh, Bibles and they uh, wrapped them all up and they, they hid them in, in that city so that uh, they figured they'd help God along <clears throat> so that if, as the Jews are there and supernaturally protected by 
Michael the archangel, if they discover these Bibles, they'll realize who Jesus is and uh, hasten the day of, uh, of the Lord's return and so forth. But uh, uh, anyway, it's uh, at that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, the nation of Israel, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written uh, in, in the book. So again, Michael is the archangel of, of Jude. He plays a prominent role when it comes to prophecy. The angel here in chapter 10 uh, is a mighty angel. Uh, we read about Michael later in Revelation 12, 7. There it says there was a war in heaven. And notice Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. Dragon already uh, uh, identified as Satan. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. So if, if you want to attribute any counterpart, certainly to Satan, it's never God. Uh, because it's God created him. He is a fallen angel. If there's a counterpart, it's Michael. Michael and his angels fought against Satan and his angels. This angel in chapter 12, 10 is a very powerful, powerful uh, angel. And, uh, and again, it's also in that chapter, Revelation 12, verse 14, it talks about Michael, again, protecting the remnant of, uh, of Israel. Uh, Talked about that on Wednesday night. Isaiah introduces us to this idea of the remnant, this, uh, this group of Jewish people that will be spared during the second half of the tribulation. So again, events of the mid-tribulation that we're looking at. All these things that we've covered up to now, there's these things that are going to go on, and there's a real concern at the end, the exhortation to John, the commandment to continue to prophesy. Why would that be hard for John? Well, because he's Jewish. And up until now, the Antichrist has been a friend of Israel. The temple has been reestablished. What he's now getting ready to hear, what he's hearing now, what he must continue to prophesy is that there's going to be a tremendous holocaust against the Jewish people. And two-thirds of the Jewish people that live on this planet will be killed during that time. There'll be a remnant. They're spared as they flee Jerusalem away from the Antichrist, and God apparently uses uh, these angels to protect him. Revelation 12, 14, but the woman, already identified as Israel, was given two wings of a great eagle, uh, eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and a half time, that's three and a half years, from the presence of the serpent or Satan. So again, that is a metaphor, the wings of eagles. So he, God, will protect them supernaturally and get them to this area and keep them there for, for three and a half years. These are things that John is hearing about. He's becoming aware of, but uh, this is not good news in a sense. Of course, you have Christ coming back. You have his millennial king. John's going to reveal all these things to us, but you understand why this is a, is a difficult thing that... Uh, that this prophecy, this little book, when it's given to John, he's going to say, you need to eat this. It's going to be sweet in your mouth and it's going to be bitter in your stomach. It's, it's really both. And I think we can, we can identify with, with that in terms of, of prophecy. Uh, the second thing about the angel, let's go on. So possibly he is Michael. At least that's my, uh, my contention, just a personal belief. But I do uh, uh, reject the idea that it's actually Jesus Christ. It's a mighty angel, a powerful angel. Obviously he has uh, uh, tremendous power as he comes and brings forth the word of prophecy in regards to the second half of the tribulation. Uh, the angel is described as having authority. His importance is emphasized because of where he is standing. He's got, uh, uh, he's one foot on the earth and one on the sea. Again, speaking of God's sovereignty uh, and, uh, and God's rule. And despite what uh, is going on on planet earth, what people may think, uh, God is, uh, is, as they say, large and in charge here. And this is a pretty large angel. Secondly, his importance is emphasized by his voice. The angel's cry is likened to a lion roaring. So uh, God's anger also is described to a lion roaring many times in the Old Testament. One of them is Amos 3.8. A lion has roared, who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken, 
who can but prophesy? And, uh, and so when this angel speaks, who is no ordinary angel, a mighty angel, a strong angel, and when he speaks, it's like a lion roaring. And again, anytime we see that in the Old Testament, it's, it's, it's not good news. It's uh, always speaking of, uh, of judgment. Uh, his importance is also emphasized <clears throat> excuse me, by the voices that accompanied him. Such thunders, again, we saw earlier coming from the throne of God in chapter 4, verse 5. And, uh, and there are seven of them that speaks of, again, Bible-wise, Bible that's a number of, <clears throat> of perfection or completeness. <clears throat> so as this angel speaks, there's actually thunders or thunderous voices that are coming from <clears throat> the very throne of God. And he, his voice is like a lion, so... Speaking of judgment, it's not good news, and uh, <clears throat> we have an incredible description here of him. What he says then, he is to swear an oath not to delay, not to delay. So let's take a look at that, verses 5 to 7. The angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are in it, that there should be delay no longer. But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished as he declared to his servants the prophets. So the oath was sworn to the, to the God of, uh, of heaven, and that's certainly emphasizing God's, God's authority is, is behind uh, all of this. It's, um, you know, it's very interesting because we now live in a in a time where this is really uh, an issue, you know, in in terms of who God is. That uh, it really has to be established that He is He is the God uh, who created everything. He is the He is the Creator, and because of the several generations of uh, now the teaching of Darwinian evolution within our school system, although although when surveyed, most people still don't believe it. Uh, it's interesting. It's not because they're Christians. It's not because they're hearing an opposing view that's not permitted uh, within the school system, uh, either high school or uh, university system. It's not permitted. It's not tolerated. If someone presents that position, they're dismissed. They're personally ridiculed and so forth. Still, people don't really believe it because as much as we do know, it just doesn't really make sense. But at the same time, it really becomes a big issue in, in sharing our faith. There was a time when, when that was not an issue, and, and the issue was, was Jesus Christ, you know, your Savior? Had you put your faith in Him? Do you see yourself as a sinner and that you need your sins forgiven? And pretty much in sharing, we could almost kind of jump right, uh, right into the gospel. And, and the big issue was, uh, in terms of our apologetic, was to present Jesus in His resurrection, that we have all this evidence that shows that Jesus Christ predicted his death, that he died exactly the way he said that he would, and then he rose again three days later from the dead, proving that uh, we can trust him, we can trust his word, and it was the proof that uh, his sacrifice for our sins had been accepted. And that's, that's really the, the gospel. But we, we almost have to dial everything back with people these days and the, really the question begins with so many people is not, do you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins? Is do you believe the universe had a beginning? That, that's really the question for, for most people. That's where we need to get to. Because if the universe had a beginning, then it had to have a begin or. As Ted Koppel said, if there was a big bang, there has to be a big banger. It, has to, it had to have begun. There's got to be a first cause. And there's a, and some good scientific as well as philosophical reasons uh, for saying that. And uh, certainly one of them is just to point uh, out the fact that the sun's up there. All scientists would agree that it's burning out. It was bigger. It was brighter. Uh, everything we learn about astronomy today now says that the universe is expanding and it's continuing out. That means it had a beginning. So, so most leading astronomers most people of, uh, uh, of uh, scientific persuasion these days do believe that the universe had a beginning. That's why many of them are at least, are at least deist or theist, and, uh, and they grapple with this idea of what we call intelligent design. 
But again, second law of thermodynamics, you can point us to some things just in talking with your friends and neighbors that says, yes, the universe had a beginning. Uh, now it's just a question of, of is that begin or? Is he personal? Can we know him? Well, he created us. And we've been created with, with personalities. And we're told, again, uh, that makes sense then that he also has a personality and that he is knowable. Th those are all things we need to establish from the beginning. I'll tell you another one. It's probably too early in the morning, but it's more of a philosophical argument. <laughs> and that is, can a man climb out of a bottomless pit? Think about that for a moment. No, he couldn't uh, because there's no bottom. So there's no, there's no starting point. So he could never climb out of a bottomless pit. So if, if time goes infinitely that way and infinitely that way, we can never arrive at now. We can never come to this place in time, at a point in time, and say, today is, and give the date and give the time. It could never happen if the universe did not have a beginning. But it did have a beginning. So therefore, we can move forward and we can mark time. You can think about over that a cup of Starbucks later. <clears throat> but that's a philosophical argument that says the universe had to have had a beginning. If it didn't, we could never logically arrive at now. And yet we are. We're here. We're communicating with each other. I can tell you the time and the date and, uh, and so forth. But anyway, it's, it's just interesting how things have changed in our culture. And we need to be able to present God is the creator. And when this mighty, mighty angel that is huge, huge at least visually, that has many of the aspects in terms of uh, appearance of divine power and so forth, that some even attribute to Jesus Christ, but I reject that. It still, it speaks of his power and his authority. When he swears an oath, he swears it to the God who is the creator over all. And so it's good for us to, to sing songs like we did this morning, reminding ourselves that God is the creator. He is the great intelligent designer. And really that becomes the issue in sharing our faith so often. Of course, when we can establish that, that God is, is there, he is the creator, he is personal, uh, he is knowable, and we can know him then through his son, Jesus Christ. How do we know that? Again, now we can go to uh, Jesus Christ's death and resurrection. Well, how can you trust the Bible? Because of predicted prophecy. And uh, it's good that we're able to logically be able to share our faith with others, unlike the other great religion of our day, which is our Darwinian evolution, which has no uh, evidence and must be taken at face value and believe explicitly by faith and faith alone. It's much more intellectually... <coughs> easy to grasp Christianity because we say it is evidential by its very nature. We look at the evidence, we look at the logic, uh, and it makes sense to us. You're all going, are you done now? Yes, I'm done now, and, and we can go on. The oath that he swore, he said that it was so important that he swore by the God who is the creator, and he swore that there would be no longer delay. No longer delay. The seventh angel was about ready to sound his trumpet, and that means as soon as he does, the second half of the tribulation would be, would be kicked off. God is now ready to complete his predicted plans for judging the world and answering, remember, the prayers of the saints that are saying, how long, O Lord? And, you know, your judgments are righteous and true. How long until you avenge our blood? And certainly that's part of what's going on in the tribulation period. The oath also sworn involves a mystery. We see the phrase, the mystery of God. And again, when we think about a mystery today, we think about a mystery novel. It's something that we don't know, but we're hoping to discover within the New Testament when that Greek word is used. It's talking about something that was not known that is now known. And the, the mystery of God in terms of God's redemptive plan for this world, uh, how it's all going to end up and how he's going to establish his kingdom here on earth uh, is, is being made known to, to John. But let's look at the third part of this. There's a description, uh, an oath not to delay. And now there's uh, the mighty angel demands that John continue. Verse 8. Then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go, take the little book, 
which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. So I went to the angel and said to him, give me the little book. And he said to me, take and eat it, and it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. Then I took the little book out of the angel's hands and ate it, and it was as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. And he said to me, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. So the, the angel demands that John take the little book and, uh, and eat it. And as, uh, as he does, and even as he hears this phrase, it would bring to his mind a very similar situation with the prophet Ezekiel. Uh, Ezekiel is, is prophesying about the fact that, um, that uh, Judah, the southern kingdom, is now going to be in a judgment from God, is going to be destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar and by the Babylonian army. And so as he does this and is predicting these things, Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 9, he has a very similar kind of thing happen to him. There it says, Now when I looked, there was a hand stretched out to me, and behold, a scroll of a book was in it. Then he spread it before me, and there was writing on the inside and on the outside, and written on it were lamentations and mourning and woe. <clears throat> Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, eat what you find, eat the scroll, and go and speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat that scroll. And he said to me, Son of man, feed your belly and fill your stomach with this scroll that I give you. So I ate, and it was in my mouth like honey in sweetness. Now, if you go on and read the passage, uh, it's, it doesn't remain sweet. Uh, and again, I think that's what prophecy does. There is a sweetness to it. Uh, we can have a lot of different kind of conferences, but one of the most popular is a prophecy conference uh, because it is, it's exciting. I mean, I, I love the fact that we can prove beyond a shadow of doubt the accuracy of, uh, of, of, of God's word. Uh, and uh, I think there is, uh, in our very nature, a desire to know what's going what's to happen, what's going to happen in the future, what's going on right now. Do the times I'm living in relate to what the Bible is saying? Are, are we close? I mean, people, uh, we're all, all very interested uh, in, in that. If I were able to say something happened this week that matches exactly what's in the scripture in terms of how close we are to the rapture. Did anybody want to hear that? No, could we just go on? I wanted to, hoping we'd have that story about Joseph again. No, if people want to, we want to know those things. We love it. It's sweet like honey to us. But at the same time, prophecy is filled in Ezekiel's day, in Isaiah's day, about judgment and woe and lamentations as well. We don't call Jeremiah, one of the great prophets of the Old Testament, the weeping prophet for nothing. Because part of what he's saying is what's going to happen in the future but part of what's going to happen in the future in their day, in our day, what John is going to have to deal with now will cause uh, great, great concern for him. Uh, David Hawking says to hear God's word and to know that he will fulfill his promises and judge this sinful world is sweet news to the believer's ears. But the longer we contemplate what God will do, the more we see the bitter is mixed with the sweet. God's people will suffer greatly during the tribulation period. We rejoice that God's plan is fulfilled and his righteous judgment executed, but we also grieve to see what his people will suffer. So anytime that we speak a prophecy in the tribulation, certainly it's a bitter and it's sweet, and uh, it certainly has to be measured with a great deal of sorrow. The second thing about this demand, the angel demanded John to prophesy again. He's told in verse 11 that he, that he must continue. And the word prophesy is uh, in the imperative. It means it's a command. And I, uh, I get curious about these things, and I, uh, I looked it up, and there's only one other place in the New Testament where that word is ever used like that. Only one other place. It's used in all three Gospels, and it's when Jesus is before the Sanhedrin. And they're ridiculing him, and they're judging him, and they're questioning him. And at one point in time, recorded in all three, they say to Jesus, prophesy. That's the word that's used here. It's a command. You will keep doing this, John. You will not stop. 
because there would be a temptation. What is he getting ready to prophesy? What's in that little book in the last three and a half years that his people, the Jewish people, are pretty much going to be annihilated except for that remnant that's carried off to the Basra that's protected by Michael, the archangel, that God has to intervene because it's through them in the end, at the end of that three and a half year period, that they cry out and they realize Jesus is the Messiah and that's what brings Jesus back to planet Earth. So when Paul says in Romans 11 that in the future, all Israel will be saved. He doesn't mean every Jewish person. He means all of those whose names are written in the book of life. All of that remnant uh, uh, will be saved. But for the rest, it will be a horrific time. And now that's besides everything else that's going on in the world under the reign and the rule and the dominance of the Antichrist who now is energized by Satan himself and demanding to be worshipped by God. And that will be the basically the the rest of the book here that we're studying. What John is taking and says, John, take this and eat it, assimilate it into, into who you are uh, as a person. Know and understand the accuracy of God's word, but have a heart for what's coming for people uh, in, in the future. I think both are, are very much required. Ravi Zacharias in a message called The Lostness of Humankind says that hell is sobering, when I was asked by Dr. Billy Graham to deal on this theme, I was not sure I was qualified. It is one of the most solemn truths in all of the Word of God. As I prayed and I studied, I was reminded what Robert W. Dale once said, quote, The only man I can listen to preaching on hell is D.L. Moody because I have never heard him talk of it without breaking down and weeping. So it's not the cynic on the golf course that says... <laughs> Hey, they're blind. Why can't they just play at night? Uh, it's not the, the boyfriend that says, nah, it doesn't matter to me if you're not religious. I'm not the one going to hell. No, it's if we understand the truth of God's word as it pertains to the future, it's like honey on our lips. Hey, we're going to be with the Lord. It'll be glorious. But it's a, in a sense, it's a bitter pill to swallow because of what's, what's coming in the future. And the, the command to John is that, you keep doing this and you keep telling the truth and you assimilate it into you like it's something that you've eaten so that you've got both sides of this in you. You have the good news of the grace of God, but also there is the judgment of God coming and he says, don't stop telling people the truth. Do you understand why there would be a temptation to do that for John and, and for anyone else? Certainly, uh, you know, there's the, there's the application for us. And, and certainly it's the, the exhortation to, the, to guys like me to keep teaching through the whole counsel of God's word. You can, you can understand how much uh, easier it would be in a sense to just teach topically. I would never teach on this stuff. The two demonic armies that are going to cover the face of the earth. Yeah, I'm kind of thinking about that. Okay, I, I think I'll move right on to something else. Let's go back to Ephesians 2.8 and we're all saved by the grace of God. There's just things that on your own uh, we wouldn't go through if, if there wasn't the, the exhortation to teach the whole counsel of God's word. I would just pick stuff I like. <laughs> wouldn't you? I like this stuff. Let's go back and teach on this again. It's one of my favorite Bible stories. You know, you would teach, I would teach, you would love to hear. And there's actually training seminars you can go to for pastors and teacher types to learn to, to minister and preach to people's felt needs so that everybody can, you know, bless me God, you know, on, uh, on, uh, on Sunday morning. So I, I can feel, I can feel that I've been, I've been ministered to. After all, that's why I come to church. No, actually, it's not. It's, we come to bless God, to worship God, and praise God despite what's going on uh, in our lives. And somehow, as I turn my thoughts to him and I look to him, I'm reminded of his greatness and who he is and his character and his goodness. And, uh, and now I'm ready to do what I'm supposed to be doing on Sunday morning, which is ministering to other people and blessing them. But we've kinda, we can get this thing inverted, and, and we can all understand why, why that would be the natural tendency. But uh, I think we obviously, we, we have a less of a tendency to go there, though that's still a tendency to, to do that if we're, if, we're, if we're doing this. In other words, this is really a, a, an exhortation to not compromise the word of God. John, you're not going to like this, 
There's going to be parts of it you like, but this is going to be bitter in your stomach. But I am commanding you. And again, we need to reflect on who's giving the command. Well, it's a strong, mighty angel in terms of his identification, his position, where he's standing, how he's standing. He's coming in a sense for a divine presence and God's sovereignty. And he's saying, John, this is it. This is what's going to happen in the future in these last three and a half years. I command you to keep telling people the truth about what's going to happen in the future. And I think we need to kind of heed the warning as well that uh, we would continue to to tell people the truth, that God does love them. He does have a plan for their lives. He graciously sent his son, his only son, to die on the cross for our sins that we might be forgiven. He substantiated that and his word by his resurrection from the dead. We can trust God's word because of predictive prophecy, but at the same time, God will judge. Hell is a real place. People are really going there. We've already learned from uh, our studies that Within the first three and a half years of the tribulation, if people do not accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior now, before the rapture comes, and they are here for the tribulation, the gospel will go out, and I, I think it primarily is going to go out to people that have never heard it before. Uh, that's just my, my opinion, and that means that every, every person in the Hawaiian Islands will die during the first three and a half uh, year period of the tribulation because all the islands will be removed. I'm pretty sure that's what we're living on here. But that's, a, that's, that's bitter. That's bitter to have in your stomach. But it's those kinds of things I think that we have to assimilate into who, who we are as believers. Do we really believe that? Did we, did, we buy, did we swallow that? Did we buy that and assimilate that? Then that should change how we view people, how we change our life, what we're doing, what we're spending our time, energy, and, and talents on, and so forth. And uh, it doesn't mean we're going to get a bigger, a really big Bible and begin to beat people over the head with it, and that's how we're going to get them into the kingdom of God. But it does mean that uh, we need to be very serious about our own relationship with the Lord. We really can't expect people to believe the truth of what we're seeing if it's not true for us, if we're not totally living it out. And I think probably each and every one of us have come to faith in Christ by the grace of God, but probably because somebody lived it out before us and somebody came to us that had some credibility because we saw a change in their life. We saw that this is real and I need what that person has. Again, so... Prophecy should really change, begin to assimilate who we are as, as evangelists, you know, and as the, the people of God, how we live and then, and then what we say to others about this life that's been entrusted to us. Does that make sense? Just to 
down on me when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. Though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name.